have shared. Stress is important, it's an important topic. When those of you who responded to the survey spoke, you said that it was very important. That's actually the top thing. So we want to talk about it because we're not exempt. Being Christian, being a dentist does not make us exempt to stress. How many of you agree? Yes. So the intent with this panel is for us to talk about this area of concern that we have so that we can learn about it. We're going to define what it is. We're going to talk about the different types of stress. And then we're going to get to conquering stress as well. So we're not just going to define the problem. We're going to talk about how these panelists have solved it. But to just get started, let's talk about stress. And I'll ask our expert panelist, Cecilia, to actually define stress for us. Well, I would like to start by saying that um, stress is a natural part of life. And the way that we define stress is um, basically stress is how the brain and the body work together to, um, I mean, how we respond to, sorry, respond to any demand or uh, perceived or real threat. So, um, Stress can be related to life events. So life events might be um, tr um, natural disasters, or it could be the birth of a baby. So that could be one type of life event stress. Then there's also daily hassles. Like we, we live in Houston, so it could be simple as just getting on the freeway and driving to work. So that's how we look at stress and that's how we define stress. The common stresses. So, could you talk with us, Cecilia, a little bit about some of the common stressors? We have um, a slide here that you probably can't see, <laughs> but um, if you could kind of glance a little bit and kind of share with us a little bit. Okay, so I'm just going to be candid here. So, I, I'm very systematic, and this is out of order for me, so I'm just going to roll with it. Um, because that's that. But um, so, looking at the slide here, um, we have what's called generation years, and so the the generation. Okay. Here, just move technology. Okay. Well, we're not in here. Things are shaking. Okay. So right now, stress because this is. Okay. okay. So this is a study that was done by the Amer American Psychological Association. And so um, it was across um, America, and it was done with the Generation Zers and those beyond that age. So Generation Zers are those that are 15 to 21 years of age. So what was common amongst them in terms of their level of stress, number one was money. The second one was work-related stressors. The third one was health concerns. And when you think about health concerns, a lot of us, you know, we struggle with having insurance. We might have it today. If we change jobs or we get laid off, we may not have, you know, insurance. So that becomes an issue for some people. And let's face it, I mean, I'm thankful that there is that marketplace, but that's not always the best option either. <clears throat> And then economy is the fourth uh, level of stress that um, people find themselves um, facing. But going back to the Generation Zers, another top stressor for them is uh, mass shootings. So 75% of 15 to 21 year olds are experiencing just the, the, the stressors related to mass shootings. 72% of 15 to 21 year olds are concerned with school shootings. That's not something that our children should have to concern themselves with, but it's a reality. The next um, slide that we'll talk a little bit about is, we're, so okay, so let's, let's pause a little bit. Um, thank you for that, Cecilia. So I'd like, so Cecilia touched on a little bit of some of the different types of stress when she opened up. There are physical, psychological, psychosocial, and psychospiritual types from a physical perspective. But um, I'd like for us to allow the panelists a little bit to talk about how they might define stressors. And just to reiterate, 
what you talk, what you mentioned, like if someone dies, if someone loses a job, if you get married, that can be deemed to be stress. If you get divorced, that can be stressful. If you have an illness, if you're raising children, single, married, all of these can, consider, can be considered to be stressors. So I just want to give the panelists also an opportunity to see how they have how they define stressors in any case, any way, and if they can just maybe identify some general ones that resonate with them. Um, perhaps um, as an educator in my field, I have over the years dealt with parents and students in the United States and in France because I'm the director of, of exchange programs and, and our students go abroad and I have very often received phone calls from parents worried about terrorist attacks in France, or French parents who might be worried about violence on American campuses. And, and so those can be very stressful situations to deal with. Well, just to, uh, even like, I like to enjoy running, and just uh, now that you mentioned that, and I don't think it's a 15, 21 year old, uh, you know, concern. <laughs> um, I'm a bit older. So every time I go to like events like that, uh, like running or have marathons or 5Ks or whatever, I, I'm always concerned. Or even at church. Uh, um, I feel like, you know, this, the, wor the world that we're living is exactly the world that is being described, you know, in the scriptures that it's you're scared to even go to worship because someone might come and do something. So it is true about that stress. I want to mention that because we think we're well, only the ones are experiencing now. Mm -hmm. But when we go to work and or I go to court, I always feel like, you know, but the only thing I can do is trust that nothing will happen to me. And if it does, it's just the Lord that, you know, it is scary. We live in a scary world. Mm -hmm. That's the only, you know, I, I'm sorry to leave it on that note, but yes, it's not the 15 to 21 year olds are not the only ones concerned about where do I put my kids in school? You know, is this going to happen to my kid? Should I just do uh, stay at home and stay with the kids? Uh, is that going to drive me crazy? But, um, <laughs> but that, those kind of stressors are the stressors that, and that I, as a mom right now, So then what you're describing is you, you're experiencing both the good and the bad stressors. Because yes. having a child can, can be deemed to be good, yes. <laughs> but then also sending them off to school into a society that can be deemed to be unsafe could be frightened, you know, as well. But I think, I think also just looking at the types of stress is important as well. Because when you think about, um, there, there are actually three different types of stress, so that's how we categorize it. Mm -hmm. So there's acute stress, and acute stress is that um, that quick, unexpected, short-term term kind of stress. So you get to work, and you are broadsided by somebody at work, and they're upset, and you have to deal with a situation. You weren't anticipating that, so that's um, acute stress. And then there's episodic stress, and episodic stress is just um, frequent bouts of acute stress. And that might be, oh, I took on too much and I'm just kind of overwhelmed. And persons that take on, that experience episodic stress might constantly be rushing, they might um, be late quite often to things, they might be disorganized. That's how I was this week. Just saying. <laughs> but that's how it felt. But then also, um, they tend to be a little bit more hostile and um, have strained relationships. And then the last um, um, stress, stressor type, is chronic stress. And that's the one, as mental health clinicians, we're concerned about. Because when you get to chronic stress, that's the never-ending stress. And if you don't manage it well, that's a frightening place to be because a lot of times people feel stuck there. And I have seen countless amount of clients who they are so stressed out 
and they feel stuck to the point where they have no way out and they well they feel like they have no way out and they talk about ending their lives or there have been people that ended their life because they felt like there was no way out. Um, the other thing that we um, look at is the fact that if you're in a chronic stress mode for a long period of time, then mental illness or mental health related issues come into play where a person might experience generalized anxiety or they might experience um, depression and then um, post-traumatic stress, which is um, a lot of times what first responders um, are exposed to, military personnel, um, nurses, mental health professionals like myself, CPS workers because they're constantly hearing and seeing things. And so they become traumatized secondarily from mm -hmm. somebody that actually has the stress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. So stress has been, has been identified as a contributory cause in 95% of all disease processes. And so um, Cecilia, I'm going to just ask um, another clinical question. What do you think are the most common causes of stress for people, and how does prolonged stress affect the brain and the ability to maintain mental health? So it's a big question. Okay. So stressors are events or conditions um, that are that's, that we are surrounded with that um, actually trigger stress. So we talked about some of them, like loss of a loved one or going through a divorce or dealing with some really traumatizing situations. But when that happens, for um, a prolonged period of time, it does affect the brain. So the, the slide that we have up here, it, we look at the, the frontal lobe, and that's the, the center where um, we are concerned with empathy, insight, response, flexibility, emotion regulation, morality is a very big one. So when we're stressed, then we're not at our full capacity. We're not on top of our game, so to speak. So we'll talk about that again, because that's going to play a part in something else that we'll discuss a little bit later. Yes. So, so this slide shows you the, the green and blue and yellow and white images on the left, on your left. Um, show the changes in the brain when you're under a lot of pressure and this person has not only stress, but it has led to depression. And then the brain on the right side is a healthy brain. So if you look at the very top, the top part is the front, front part of the brain. If you look at the one on the right side, the frontal lobe is not lit up. It looks very different. So. So that person is affected. So in terms of their ability to um, make decisions and choices and have a stable emotional, um, well, a level of uh, stress or ability to manage stress, it is not there. So that's, that's very dangerous. Thank you for that, Cecilia. So when we're stressed out, it affects your brain. We only have one. <laughs> And the other thing I'm, I have to add is that um, there's a, a very good book that um, that I would recommend for anyone. Um, it's it's called The Art of Thinking. Dr. Neil Medley um, has put out that book, and it talks a lot about emotional intelligence, how we can regain those uh, the, the way of thinking, mm -hmm. how we can transform our thinking through Christ. But sometimes, I think we all can admit to having irrational thoughts. And so when you have those negative, irrational thoughts and they run and we ruminate on them, it just takes us down a different path. But he also talks about in that book that the brain actually shrinks when we're under undue stress for a long period of time. So that's kind of scary. It is very scary. Thank you for that, Cecilia. So, so we'd like to. Is this what your brain is feeling at that particular time, or is that over a period of time? That's over a period of time. So, if you're chronically stressed, this is what happens on the left side. 
with Dr. Amoyo. Um, you work in a pharmacy, you've been a pharmacist, and I know you see a lot that comes through your pharmacy. You see what people prescribe, what's happening. So can you just kind of share your perspective on any stress-related cases uh, that have come through your pharmacy? That's very broad. Um, um, stress is a physiological reaction to a threat. So what happens in your body is your body releases adrenaline and cortisol. So cortisol is a hormone, it's a smaller stress hormone. So what it does, it tends to help you react to that threat, but it forgets to think your reproductive section of your body, and that's why a lot of women have problems when they have stress. And also, the other section that it forgets is um, the, um, there's a reproductive and then there's also the uh, digestive. So, when I say a lot of the prescriptions that come through the pharmacy, this is sad, but I will say about 70% of our prescriptions are antidepressants. Mm. Anxiety, antidepressants, um, bipolar, mental illness, just stuff related to stress. And I, if I can break it down, stress exacerbates all the diseases. Yeah. Mm. From blood pressure. Blood pressure when you get stressed, you have uh, your blood vessels constrict, heart rate goes up. Up. Diabetes. You're stressed. When you're stressed, you tend to go to your comfort food, so you forget your habits, and so you start, start eating, you know, unhealthy. And also that increases your glucose levels, right? Um, it also affects asthma. When you have stress, it increases your heart rate. With your heart rate going up, you have tend to be, you know, faster, and yeah, it affects asthma. Um, it affects also obesity. Obesity comes and one of the cortisol hormones, it causes obesity, and it causes us women especially to have uh, fat around our belly all the time. Um, it affects how we age, right? When we have stress, we have lines in our faces we don't want, we run to the pharmacy, to the doctor, the doctor prescribes you some creams, and you come in here and, and you meet the pharmacy and get your prescription, but if you look underneath, we, we need all that is stress, right? Um, so there's so many, uh, also depression, right? Wait, wait, let's not forget about depression. Mm -hmm. um, with all these patients that have, are an antidepressant. Uh, but one thing I do know for sure is a lot of us, we tend to, and especially women, we tend to just put it on the side and with time, as Cecilia was talking about in the brain, is your brain is constantly moving with certain chemicals. There's something called neurotransmitters, and there are different kinds of neurotransmitters in the brain. We have dopamine, we have serotonin, um, we have neuroepinephrine. All those are chemicals that help transmit messages in our brain. So if you're constantly stressed, those chemicals sometimes need help, and that's why the doctor ends up giving us antidepressants. So, yeah, we've seen a lot of cases of antidepressants coming in, but as a Christian woman, let's not forget that if you need it, reach out to your doctor. There's nothing wrong with you yes, uh, reaching out to your doctor and getting help that you need. Um, we can pray all we can, but God has given very many smart people to come up with medicines that can help with that brain. So, thank you for that, Dr. Moyen. Could I just ask you a follow-up question? Is there anything that surprises you the most? through all the cases that come through. What surprises me the most is, with years of pharmacy, I've been a pharmacist for 15 years, is how young these kids are coming up with depression. I've seen kids as young as seven, eight, being prescribed antidepressants. And to me, that really is heartbreaking. Yeah, wow, that's really compelling. Thank you for that. We're going to move on to Lisa. Um, we want to give you a chance to kind of comment on how either you have been impacted by stress or your clients have been impacted by stress as well. Yeah, um, well, 
in my career, and especially what I am doing right now, uh, is with um, child protective ca uh, cases, specifically drug court, I see how stress goes from one generation. If one person is stressed, like the mom is stressed, or the family is stressed, it goes from one generation to another generation to another generation. And it's sad, like you were mentioning, I deal with uh, children also that are oh, they're medicated because of depression and all uh, all the stressors that are going in their lives. So I have seen how stress um, can really uh, affect a, a young mind, and uh, especially uh, women that go through very difficult things in their lives and they go through and they use drugs instead of like um, medicated drugs they go through um, um, whatever drug they can get in order to um, stay alive you know like it's sad it's just sad and uh, that impacted me uh, because I think um, I now I see my stresses a little bit different and I, uh, like I said, I do count my blessings. Mm -hmm. uh, it has impacted uh, also, I, when I came here, career changes, uh, or even moving from one uh, uh, Puerto Rico, which has a practice of the law, a little bit different from here. Mm -hmm. And also the peers are a little bit, the, the way we uh, interact. interact with each other are a little bit different, and that, cause me stress and I, I don't fear now to admit that every time at the beginning when I came here I step into a courtroom psychosomatic right the uh, uh, changes a uh, uh, feeling of uh, um, uh, I felt like I'm warm not but like I, I needed to like get out of the room <laughs> or inside thank you and and I felt for a moment that I could not you know practice mm -hmm. any longer. So stress did impact me, uh, even just by moving from one state to another mm -hmm. and dealing with a different kind of practice of the law. So um, that has uh, impacted me. But certainly stress in other people, like in drug courts, it is sad to see how our, our clients, especially women, because they're the ones who are raising the children, <laughs> they uh, go to different uh, stressors in their lives, and they pass it generation to generation to generation, and, and it's, not, it's not even their fault. Mm -hmm. How do you separate that so you don't bring it all home? You, you, I, you know how I dealt with it? Yeah. Counting my blessings. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I dealt with, I had a 30-year-old 30 30 year client who was 37 or 36 at the moment, at the time, my same age, eight children or so, um, but she was raped by her her dad. Um, she was HIV positive. Her, you know, she had uh, she was used as a payment for uh, drugs mm -hmm. by the parents. So th when I saw that, and I stopped honestly complaining mm -hmm. a little bit, including why I don't have children at the moment, why I didn't have children. And I started counting my blessings. It sounds a little bit hard to say, but it, it did help me. So I do separate it because uh, whenever I come home, I try, I said, I, I try, I'm trying to do my best. Mm -hmm. it may, I may not be perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure there's a better attorney, there's a better, you know, someone that can do a better job. But I, I try to separate it because I cannot bring all that to my home. I can learn from it mm -hmm. and try not to repeat it. Mm -hmm. That's, That's how I, I deal with it. Thank you so much, Amelisa. And could we ask Jenny, um, you, we know that you work in a university environment, medical environment, and could you let us know how you've helped others manage stress in the workplace? Or how have you managed it? Uh, to answer your question in the workplace, I manage a, a, a supervisor group of six with my customers or everybody in the medical school, and it's the largest in the medical school, so I have quite a bit of touch points with everybody, and because of the role, I 
just happened to transition and become a sounding board for a lot of people. And by sounding board, it's venting, it's complaining, it's rarely praise, but <laughs> that is my role. And so I approach this from a perspective of the way I talk to God, they just need somebody else to talk to. And if I'm that conduit that lets them unleash or lets them at least get it out, then I know I've done my job. Even without saying a single word, you would be surprised how many conversations where I've said literally just, hi. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> so, it's also, that's all people need. Especially us as women, we have a lot to say. We're very opinionated. <laughs> You know, that what, that's what makes us special. Um, in my own life, uh, I am a single mom. I have no support system here. My family lives 1,200 miles away, so it's just me and my son. So I do lead a stressful life, but I will say, maybe it's the, the way my psyche is, I thrive on stress. I like stress because it makes me productive. It forces me to make decisions that really matter. I don't sweat the small stuff. Good. And I wake up every day saying, thank you, God, just let me get through this day. And as long as my son is happy and healthy, so am I. And you have to. And I feel like with the previous notes, there were a little bit of it on the downside. You know, I, I have those worries, but if you let the things that are outside of your own control worry you and stress you out, us as women, we love to do that because we, the way our mind works is like puzzle pieces. What if A happens, then B will happen, then C will happen, then D will happen? Calm down. <laughs> we'll, we'll worry about A first, and then let's, let's cross that bridge when we get it. So I just encourage us as women just to manage it effectively because you never know what could happen, but you cannot worry about things that are outside of control. So let, you know, and that was something that I really had to learn the hard way through, through some experiences, and I just learned to let go and let God. Focus on what matters most, let God do the rest, and I can tell you from my own experiences, I am happy, I am genuinely happy, and I am blessed, and it's because that I have learned to let go, and I have a type A personality, so mm -hmm. for me to say that, it's big deal. difficult, <laughs> difficult. Um, but you let go, you let God, and He will take care of you, and I, I promise you this to be the case. And, as far as stress relators go, I understand that, you know, people have stress and it does become, you know, affects people in different ways, you know, but I am fortunate enough and I am blessed to say maybe God just built me in that way, but stress, stress is a good thing for me personally and because of the life that I live, um, I use it to keep me going because if I didn't, I don't know where I would be. So. Thank you so much, that's very empowering. Thank you so much. Okay, Dr. Dr. Price, um, Price, We'd like to switch to you and ask you, how has stress impacted your career um, and your students on, you know, throughout various countries you've worked? Um, as, I, as I said earlier, I have dealt with students who deal with culture shock. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many here have come to the United States and and encountered a different culture from the one you've been used to in your home country, and dealing with anxiety, dealing with depression, just being unhappy, and why, why did I ever go abroad? Why didn't I stay home? That question that students ask themselves. And, and so I've, I've been in many stressful situations trying to help students get over you know, there's the honeymoon period, and then you, you're happy, there's a certain euphoria, and everything's new, it's exciting, and then reality sets in, and then you drop down, and you're, you're very sad. And then when they go back home, often experience the counter culture shock. Oh no, I'm back home, I've gotten used to another culture, another country, now I have to get used to my own again. So, but I think the most stressful situations have been dealing with parents, who are worried about their children, their children who are adults, but still, they're still their children. And, and just two, two weeks ago, I got a text, and it was almost midnight, and it was a mother in Pennsylvania whose daughter was in Strasburg, and she knew I was in the United States. Could I please help her? Because her daughter's not home yet. 
okay. <laughs> and it was, it was, then it would have been almost six o'clock in the morning for her daughter, and her daughter, when she did go out, always contacted her, let her know when she got home, and she hadn't yet heard from her. What could I do to help her? <laughs> so those kinds of situations, and, and going back and forth with many texts and phone calls, and this had been gone, going on for a couple of weeks because I knew the, the daughter was, was having problems. And at the end, when everything turned out, the daughter was found, she was safe, et cetera, et cetera. I'll, I'll make the long story short, but the mother said to me, we were able to exchange the fact that we were both mothers. I can relate to parents, explain that I also have children who also studied abroad. And I know, understood what they were going through and being able to share that and being on the same level and letting them know that they are not alone. Thank you. Think that's a thing, even as, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and, and that realization and, and then acknowledging that we both are on the same wavelength, you have to be very careful. In, in, in France, as in the United States, there's a separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. However, in the United States, with the existence of what we call civil religion, there's religion, religious indicators everywhere in our society. Well, in France, there is a real separation of church and state. And so you have to be very careful when you, when you talk about something divine or help that comes from above. People are sustained in these difficult moments because of their faith, because of, of God. So you have to be very, tread very softly. But when there is a connection and they understand and we are on the same wavelength that yes, we're not alone, as parents, and we do have help from above. That's a very strong moment. Thank you. When you said that, um, Dr. Price Price, what do you mean exactly for those who might follow what that feels like when you're in France? Culture shock? You yeah, know, the, the separation of church and state. Like, for instance, on Sundays, are all the shops closed um, to buy groceries, or how would a student um, experience well, that? Well, we had a student from Texas A&M who was in France, and he said, well, what do you do on Sundays? Everything's closed. Mm -hmm. I can't go to the mall to go shopping. Not that he was thinking of anything in any religious terms. Um, but separation of church and state meaning that there would never be any reference to God in the government. There would never be any prayer before any kind of religious, you know, the French Assemblée Nationale, which is the the equivalent of our Congress, you wouldn't have a chaplain, there wouldn't be any prayer before cha before a session or before the Senate meetings, there wouldn't be a prayer. No one would say, in God we trust, our money, their French coins have no reference to God. So it's a, it's a true separation. Um, except in the area where I live, in Strasbourg, which is in the east of France, because at the time when there was a separation in 1905, when France, divorced from the church, so to speak, from the Catholic Church. That area where I live, which is along the German border, it's called Alsace-Lorraine in, in the United States, you call it two regions that are side by side. That was German at the time, and the relationship in Germany is not the same as in France. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in the area where I live, and which explains why there are so many international students in our church in Strasbourg, is because you can study theology, Catholic and Protestant, at the University of Strasbourg. No other university in France would ever teach religion in, within the university. Mm -hmm. And pastors, rabbis, and priests are actually paid by the French government. So only in the area where I am, outside of that, is a total separation. So it's, it's a, interesting. And when, I, I taught in class for many years on the role of religion in the United States, and French students, in learning about and hearing the president refer to God, they said, but wait a minute, that can't be the First Amendment. We're not understanding that correctly, are, are we? And I said, well, yes, you are. It's just that we also have a civil religion, and so um, we play on two fields at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's Thank very you. interesting. Um, so, Cecilia, could you share with us any strategies or protocols you might have deployed with some of your clients 
and their patients to help manage and conquer stress. So let me just frame this up. That we, I fully, I feel like we've identified the issues substantially within a given time, but I think it'll be helpful for all of us to kind of move on and, and start discussing how we, we're planning on conquering stress. So we're gonna ask the panelists some questions to kind of talk about how they helped themselves or help um, you know, others in the workplace conquer stress. So to restate the question again, I mean, you're welcome to answer this from a personal perspective, a family perspective, or a clinical perspective as well. So um, I'm thankful for events like this because I feel like um, as we educate ourselves, as we share with each other, we are actually a torch to go out into the world because when I'm out there, I see darkness. And sometimes it's literal darkness where people are seeing demons and you know that kind of thing. And so I think we're blessed and fortunate to have each other and to have this community of um, sisterhood and, um, and believers that support. But when you go out there, it's a totally different ball game. Um, so in the job that I had before, I dealt with a lot of um, persons that were diagnosed with severe schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, um, you know, you name it, they have it. And so um, one of the things that we, um, we as clinicians, we do to help people is first of all, find out what is the motivation for change? Is there motivation for change? Because if not, then I'm doing all the work and you know, they're kind of on easy street. So I think um, that's number one for me. And then the other thing is we often use cognitive behavioral therapy, which looks at how people think. I think Jenny mentioned um, earlier, or somebody mentioned, um, you know, we have to think about what we're thinking about in essence, because, you know, sometimes we get on that, that negative railroad track and we can't get off. I kind of like what, what one of my friends said to me, um, and she holds fast to it. She says she gives people that are saying negative things, she gives them 15 minutes. <laughs> and when that 15 minutes is up, she says, okay, can I pray for you because we're moving on. <laughs> so she knows who she is and she is in this room. And I like that because we have to keep each other accountable and we have to support each other and encourage each other because you know, we are, uh, we should be tools of empowerment for each other here. So the other thing, um, when we talk about um, cognitive behavioral therapy, we look at reality testing. So that might be answering the question, what is evidence for or against? Do you have any evidence? Like you're in the court of law, what is the evidence for what you're thinking? If there's no evidence, you've got to toss it. Another thing is looking for alternative explanations. What else could this mean? Yes, she could be looking at you and she may not like you, but what else could she be thinking about you? Maybe she's looking at your shoes, or maybe she likes the way you carry yourself. So we challenge those things as well. And then putting it into perspective. Is the situation as bad as I make it out to be? I think sometimes we get stuck in what we call catastrophizing, where we everything is just bad, everything is just negative. It's just not gonna turn out right. I just don't, we have to be able to stop ourselves, and that's where we get into emotional intelligence. It's different from IQ. IQ can be passed on from somebody, you know, from your parents to you, but emotional intelligence is very different. That's something that we have to cultivate and that we have to work on. Um, because it doesn't come as first nature um, for us or to us. And then the other thing, on a personal note, um, the job that I had before was so super stressful. I thought I was gonna lose my mind. And, um, but um, what I can tell you is I went through periods where I would forget to breathe. Not like, you know, you and I are breathing right now, <laughs> But I would just, I'm thinking about, okay, there's a client out in the lobby that's cutting up, and then I'm scheduled to see another client, 
And it's just like, you know, you're running around trying to manage things. And literally, I would breathe so fast, I thought if I don't slow it down, I'm going to hyperventilate and I'm going to have a panic attack and I won't be able to help my clients. So I had to stop myself and say, okay, they're okay. Somebody, if, if I'm not able to help them right now, they will be okay. But I need to breathe and I need to slow my day down so that I'm okay. And I think we have to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lisa, I'd like to, <laughs> don't be long, I'll give you a moment. <laughs> um, you shared with us that you have a beautiful set of twins um, and a brand new baby girl. Um, how did this, so this is beautiful, okay? Yeah. Um, we would consider this to be good stress, right? But how did it really impact your household? And what our minds want to know, and how are you able to manage this quote unquote new stress, good stress? Well, um, as all you know, and maybe Tracy, and I also think of Beth every time I, I think of you. <laughs> um, because you have beautiful family, beautiful, like, you have your twin, and I have mine, and, and I pray to God for a family, and I got a lot of kids. <laughs> so, um, and I don't know. <laughs> But uh, the, the way I am dealing with um, the reality of like the way my life is changing is uh, even professionally it's changing. Um, I ask other moms, I go to other moms. Uh, I ask uh, other dads, because I have a bunch of uh, stay at home dads that I also talk to. <laughs> and um, I try to uh, be honest to them, sometimes uh, too honest, and, and let them know how I feel, you know, uh, because I would like to know, they're going through the same thing, and or they already went through the same thing, so they're like, don't, don't panic, you can do this, you know, you, and, or they give me, um, just tips of how to deal with my kids, and also in the marriage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kids, um, the person that have kids to save their marriage, that, that, that's not the way to, you know, save the marriage. That's not a way to be happy. And I realized that too. Um, you know, they make you happy, but you have to um, also think about yourself first. There's two books that are amazing. Uh, uh, it's um, Screen Free Parenting, I think I've told yeah, you. Mentioned it. All the books, I love all these books because all the books are my savior. I cannot read. There's no way I can read. So every time I have the opportunity, I put on my audiobooks and I listen to audiobooks. Uh, I met up with a few ladies here at church. I think uh, Beth and you were some with a church with, and then we met and uh, groups here at church mm -hmm. and we read a good book about raising children in the seven day, day seven day Adventist household. Um, but. Audiobooks are amazing, and these two audiobooks, Screen Free Parenting and Screen Free Marriage by Hal Rumsfeld, oh my God, they changed my life. Because uh, they, he goes, and he's Christian, he's not Seventh-day Adventist, but he's Christian, and um, he says that as a parent and as a, a partner in a marriage, you have to first, like, like you're in an airplane, save yourself first, and then think about the other ones, and, and put that mask, that oxygen mask first, and that book, it was life changing because I always think about the other ones, never about me, or I always thought he is the problem, or the baby is the problem, or you know, but never like, wait a minute, relax, you are the one who are, you need to, they, see, they need to see you relax. They need to see you stress-free mm -hmm. in order for them to be stress-free as well. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have an opportunity to listen or to read to that, uh, read those books, they're amazing. Talk to another mom or another uh, person that's going through the same thing. Like I talked to Tracy and I asked Tracy, how do you do it? Like with twins, boys, like how do you do it? How do you come to church and you're always, they're always so well-dressed and they're amazing. <laughs> and they're, it, and or bet you know and and i i go to that person and ask honestly how do you do it and i i also uh would like to say that um, i always look at jesus 
and Jesus was human too. Mm -hmm. So he went through the same uh, experiences that humans go through. So I, I always go and see what he did when he was upset. Because yes, he did. He was upset. You can read in the Bible. <laughs> he got upset sometimes. He uh, when how he dealt with um, their family, family issues, and how he dealt with um, pain, and how he dealt with loss, like we discussed here with a, a peer just right now. How how do you deal with loss of a partner for forty years? You know all that. Um, I, I think Jesus can show us, and the women in the Bible can show us, um, that they went through the same thing, and they, the ones that uh, were um, successful were the ones who, like you, Jenny, decided to give it all. Like, you know, give it to Jesus, and Jesus will take care of it, and I can do the rest. So, I look to the Bible. That's my, you know, uh, my inspiration. Bible and the women in the Bible and Jesus. That's one of them. I noticed that you also, we don't have time, but you also run marathons. Oh, you run? No, no. Have, you run marathons. Have 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 you are a wife, you are a you know, working woman, a pharmacist, you're involved in ministry. How do you conquer stress and help others? And as for all, for many of you who know Dr. Moy, she's so calm nature. You never see her like scream, at least at church. So how do you do that and conquer stress? Because I know there are things that are going on in life too. Are you getting your own stress? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, one of the things Jenny said, which is very important, is stress is good sometimes. It pushes you. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes you focused and kind of, you know, I think you kind of reach a point whereby you have better time management, actually. Because if you don't have time management, you're, you're doomed. Things, you'll end up being stressed. Um, so for me, actually, so many things, of course, just trusting God in everything. Um, the way I look at fear or worry, it's either two ways. It's either something in the future. It's not happened yet. But you're worried it's going to happen. Or it's happened, and there's nothing you can do about it. But for the, present time, for, for the present moment, a lot of people forget about the present moment. And the way I've learned to do things, like I've gone through stressful times in my life, is to deal with that time. When I'm doing, when I'm, what I'm doing at that time, I consciously think about it. If it's walking, I think, okay, I'm walking, I'm enjoying nature, I'm traveling, I'm enjoying traveling. Um, we're having dinner together, I'm enjoying this moment. Mm -hmm. And I live day by day. And that's how I've gone through very stressful times in my life. Also, another thing I would suggest is, and it's a, it's a study, actually. They were saying that if you exercise just three times a week, it's like taking an antidepressant, one drug a day. So it really helps. Exercises helps, diet helps. A lot of people know. I mean, like, not badly, but meat takes more to digest in your tummy. So, increases the acidity in your stomach. So, yeah, that can be stressful indirectly without you realizing it. Um, another thing is, uh, I think it's just time management. Mm -hmm. Learning how to put things in the right bucket. What is important, what's not important, and prioritizing. Another thing that really frustrates a lot of women or just people in, in nature is procrastination. We procrastinate a lot. That stresses us out a lot. Um, so for me, that's how I stress. I mean, that's how I manage stress. Thank that's you. Okay. That's very, very helpful. Thank you. And Jenny, since you have the mic now, we talked a little bit about you know the fact that well we haven't, but I've noticed that Jenny's had a steady ascension in her career. She is. She's come, she's come to Houston, she's done very well. 
and she's pulled people up around her, I can only imagine. And so, I, we know that stress has been a part of it, but how are you able to really move the roadblocks and de-stress? You talked a little bit about listening to people. How have you been able to do that as well? I'm thinking how to say this nicely. <laughs> I tune people out. So for people, who don't, for people who don't have the time to read or like to read, I tune people out. Uh, while I'm a sounding board for a lot of people, I love my family, I love my friends, I tune people out. And I put myself in a dark hole of nothing, mm -hmm. even if it means five minutes before my son starts screaming again. It makes me sane. Mm -hmm. And I've just learned to embrace the stress. I think I said that I like the stress, but that's because I know what it does to me. It forces me to react, it makes me do something, and if I don't do something, then something else may happen. So I think about, I try to be five steps ahead, but half the time I'm falling flat on my face, and I'm actually surprised I didn't trip when I went up the stairs. But to answer the question, I, I do what I can. We're only human, and I do exercise, I do things by myself. Some women do not like being by themselves, that's fine. You have a girlfriend, you have your family, you have your mom to talk to, that's great. Other women just need time to themselves, and, and I'm one of those that is, I am perfectly content with being by myself, mm -hmm. because I'm not listening to anybody's opinions, I'm not listening to anybody's problems, nobody's listening to mine, and I'm perfectly happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> because I do it all week. So, not to say that I can, you know, and I, I, I'm on a note to say anybody in this room, if you want to talk, I will listen and not say a word. That would be my help to you, that's fine. But I also want to say on the other side of the spectrum, not to be funny or facetious or anything, but if you don't get it out somehow, I don't want you to become to the point where you're a soda can and you just explode. Release some of that pressure and say something, do something. I did a one week kickboxing class and I felt fantastic to punch something. I mean, whatever it takes, do it. Because it's healthy, it helps you move on, it helps you be a better mom, a better wife, a better person, a better coworker. So to, to go along the lines of what the doctor was saying, you have to do things, something for yourself. You have to be selfish sometimes because as women, we are just the mother hand and we worry about everybody else being okay. But if you are not okay, you will not make anybody else's life that much easier. And so I encourage you, take time for yourself. And if you're not allowed that time, push back. Be selfish. You can say no. No is a very popular word in my life. Thank you, Betty. So, um, Dr. Clark's part, could you quickly share with us a similar question? How well, did you conquer stress? I think that was a very good conclusion. <laughs> Seriously, I think what she just said was, was very spot on, mm -hmm. as they say, and I can only, uh, well, everything that's been said here on the panel today, I think has been uh, very good advice. How do I deal with step stress? Is that what you want to know? <laughs> yes, I mean, but um, if you feel comfortable with the summation, it's fine. Um, I'm just asking you on a, on a personal level because I asked you to talk about your students and university life. So I just wanted to give you an opportunity mm -hmm. to see if you've conquered it in a special way with your family life, you know, having children living in different places. But um, we can just quickly. I think the share. list, because it's long, <laughs> equals stress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right now I've been returning to France after six months here in Houston, in the States, and I'm experiencing a lot of stress, mm -hmm. just packing, for example. Mm -hmm. How can you put six months worth into one or two small suitcases? Um, you ever tried to put a large object into a small object? That, that's stressful. Um, driving around Houston, the potholes everywhere, well, that's stressful. <laughs> trying to do all the errands to accomplish before I leave. And we bought a small used car when we came. It's low to the ground. And trust me, I know how many potholes there are everywhere. And you have to navigate through the streets on Memorial, for example. Sometimes you're in the right lane. Sometimes you're in the left lane. It, so 
um, stressful also. Uh, I'm a grandmother now, um, and I'm figuring out the schedule now. I'll be able to see our son who lives in Paris and the grandson, so we've worked out the weeks where he'll be staying with us, and I'm and I know that the potty training is the summer. It's a good time to finish that potty training. It's already been started, so I'm stressing already <laughs> about potty training. And, and you have no control. I know. And it's, I have three boys, so I know that it's nothing that you can command. And you just, it's, it's, when it's there, it's there, right? Um, I think also stress. In the retirement community here, we started a choir in one of them. And so, will the 99-year-old who's going to sing a solo right before the concert, will her voice work that day? That's been stressful. Um, yes, children in different, in different cities in, in New York, and will they have the job? Will our children be happy? Will they have the jobs that they want to have? Will they? thinking of something worthy and not just making money. I think as parents, we, we worry about uh, our children's happiness and do they have the right partner and, and are they on the right path? Are we on the right path as parents? I think we all have stressful situations that we have to deal with and, and with prayer, hopefully. Uh, going to sleep at night, I have trouble at night sometimes, I say, Jesus, help me go to sleep. It's going to be okay. You know, I pray for his peace. Um, well, thank you, thank you. That's very, very helpful. And um, we're at time for the panel. How have you found this to be helpful? Yes, did we cover topics that were of interest? We quickly, we quickly covered a couple of topics just to see. What I'd like to say is that um, it's okay to admit to being stressed out. Yes, we're, we're women, we're Christian women, many of us are Seventh-day Adventist women. Um, it does not mean that you lack faith, per se. You can have a moment, and it's okay. Um, I can tell by the look on your face that we've all been through something, and it's okay. The intent for this is was to show you that we are, we're just not plastic people. We may look happy for Sabbath, but we cry sometimes during the week, sometimes right before we come to church. And so we all have different coping mechanisms so that we can actually not just cope, but actually um, conquer stress. Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed hearing um, Jenny talk about the fact that stress really pushes you, it pushes her. So yes, good stress can really, really be there. Um, relying on God seems to be a theme for all of the women. At the end, you can have all of the degrees, you can look nice, but if you don't have God, you're really not going to cope. <laughs> where you're not going to really be able to cope. Um, managing your time, living in the moment, understanding that when we're stressed out, it really affects our brain. And we don't want our brain to look like the brain on the left. We want to have optimal functioning um, of, of the brain. So um, I just would like to thank the panel for working with me <laughs> and working with all of us and making themselves vulnerable um, <laughs> here and sharing some of their personal stories because it's not easy. Um, for everyone. Um, so quite honestly, we're at time. We can open it up for maybe five minutes at most for any questions that you might have, and we'll see if we can answer them. So if anyone has a question or two, this will be the time to kind of open it up, and then after that we'll just move into uh, some, some